My name is Jeffrey Baum. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for, here at the USC Annenberg School for Communication. And I just want to introduce our panel, and then we're going to uh, have a panel discussion. Then there'll be questions from the audience. If you have a question from the audience, just raise your hand, and one of our ambassadors will bring a microphone to you because we are recording this panel discussion for live webcast. So it's uh, available live on the web. And at the conclusion of the panel discussion, we will be having a reception upstairs where we can have, uh, continue the discussion. So please help me in welcoming for our panel discussion, Davis Guggenheim, the director of first year. <laughs> Nate Monley, the teacher who you all met uh, during the movie. <laughs> Joy Craft Watts, who you also met during the movie. and our own dean of the Rossier School of Education here at uh, the University of Southern California, Dean Karen Sims Gallagher. And then the narrator of the PBS uh, presentation of this was the actress Elizabeth Shue, and she will lead off the uh, discussion. Elizabeth Shue. <laughs> it's an unusual event. No, no, no. 
What, what, say it again. <laughs> Sounds like my husband. <laughs> I'm sorry. What, what, honey? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listening is the other thing. I want to know if there's anything you learned through the process of making the film. If there's somebody in the audience who's thinking about becoming a teacher, what would you tell them? Tell them from what would you tell them about, after your experience about what it's like to be a teacher, what you learned about what it's like to be a teacher? Well, um, I, I think Karen will speak a lot about the um, and Joy and Nate will speak about what it means to be a teacher. Sometimes filmmakers tend to jump into situations that they maybe shouldn't in analyzing them. And I try not to analyze the role of teacher that much. I think what was interesting was that the rewards of teaching uh, uh, are, from what I watch these guys, the rewards of teaching uh, come in a delayed effect and they come in ways you don't expect. And it's like a paycheck that sort of, it's like an IRA <laughs> that, that, that comes. And, and when you think you watch certain events and you see how much they invest in certain kids in certain situations, and you say, wow, they're just giving and they're giving and nothing is coming back. And then when it comes back, it comes back in ways um, which are very powerful, in ways in which you can't quantify or maybe other people don't even see. You know, when we were shooting, you'd see things that uh, we teachers would be getting all this wonderful stuff back, but no one sees. It's this teacher, you know, alone after school with one kid or the last day of school or a phone call three years later. And these guys can talk about that. But to me, that's in the press, you read about paychecks, you read about um, curriculum, you read about standards and everything like that. What you don't necessarily, that's the one thing that. <laughs> Nate, I want to ask you, um, since so many people in your family are teachers, did you have any preconceived notions of what it was going to be like to be a teacher? And after your own experience, how was it different from what they would all tell you it was like versus what it was really like for you? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I definitely had a lot of preconceived ideas. Uh, been, I grew up across the street from the school where I went, where my mom was a teacher, and my family was very involved. So it's kind of a, around schools and classrooms like anybody was. Uh, but it, it was a lot different uh, to actually be in charge, of course. I didn't realize how much work went into it. I admire my mom a lot more now, and my, and my dad, and my grandma, and everybody else that is a teacher. There's there's just a ton of work that you don't think about. And uh, it's also, it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. I mean, it's funny, I'm in my third year now. I'm, I'm no veteran by any means. But thinking back on my first impressions, it was so much harder than I thought it was going to be. Even though I, I joined teaching through a program called Teach for America, which is an awesome program. And they do a lot of preparation. But still, when you get in there, it was, it was, it was very, uh, um, consuming, and, yeah, it was frustrating. It was a frustrating job, and like David said, it, a lot of the things that were positive about it came out in the small things, and they came out even now in my third year. There's things that I, uh, the benefits I'm reaping from the first year, kids that come by to visit, and progress I've seen them make, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Joy, uh, how? Well, you're in your third year, so I have two questions. Um, I wanted to know how you hope the film will help future teachers, um, and also just how different the third year has been from the first year, or how similar. Okay. <clears throat> well, the film, it's, it's sort of scary when a documentary filmmaker comes to you two days before your first day of teaching <laughs> and pitches this idea to you. Um, and, and of course, all the veteran teachers are telling me, watch out. They do these exposés on how bad schools are, and they're going to make you look like a bumbling idiot. Um, and putting faith in what Davis had to say was his vision, which was he felt that teachers were heroes. Um, and he wanted to show the struggles and obstacles that we had to undergo um, getting started in the profession. And I just put faith 
and trust in Davis that, um, you know, and, and hope that I wouldn't make such a big mistake on film <laughs> for the world to see, but that the mistakes that I would make or the struggles I would have or the obstacles I encountered would, would not be unique to me, but would be specific to anyone in teaching, not even just in their first year of teaching, but all teachers. I mean, I talk to veteran teachers who so much relate to the obstacles we experienced in the film. And, you know, the clip that you saw with, you know, George dealing with ESL issues, you know, we all have those stories, you know, like the stories I could, I have Nate's story and George's stories and Genevieve, it's like all of everyone's experiences in a sort of a eclectic group, but it, it's something universal to teaching. So I just hope that the film would inspire people, which I think it has. Um, and I hope that, you know, that people would see that when you hear all of the negativity about education and test scores and that you would know that there's still people out there trying. Um, there are a lot of people making differences. Uh, it's not all of the negative stuff that you see on, in the news. Um, the second part of your question about the being in my third year of teaching, you learn how to work the system a lot better. Um, you have your own classroom? Yes, I have my own classroom. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's still constantly in jeopardy. Um, you know, they're, go they're opening bungalows and uh, but if we get the bungalows, then we, we still have, there's, I just was talking to a first year teacher who is traveling. I mean, the, the union negotiated last year in our teacher contract that no longer will first year credentialed teachers have to travel. This happens to be an emergency credentialed teacher who's, I think that's like throwing you into the, sh like, to the sharks because they give you no training and say, go ahead and teach. Um, and that's what this person's situation is, and he's traveling to four different classrooms. And I just said, I know you need a little wheelie cart. It's, mm -hmm. it's tough. Um, but it, it's constantly, you know, you're just trying to make things work. I don't know, sometimes I feel selfish that I have a classroom, and now there's this other first-year teacher who's traveling and figuring out all the ropes at the same time. It's just, it's just hard, and I know that even though the district is putting in bungalows at my school, that means they're going to increase our enrollment, so we go right back to square one again. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the uh, idiocracy of the whole system gets frustrating. Um, I'd like to know how severe the, the teacher shortage is, and also what are some of the things that you feel first-year teachers need more of to be successful? Well, let me start with the second question. And first of all, by saying I was also a first year teacher um, eons ago in, the, uh, in Seattle, Washington. And that your, the film has brought back all those things that, you know, in 30 years, which it's about 30 years ago, hmm. you know, the same uh, <coughs> working with students, work, trying to understand the system, being a first year teacher, having four different classrooms, traveling around. I mean, those things don't change in some ways. Also, what doesn't change is the, uh, um, the joy you get from it, the hope you get, because of working with the kids and, and uh, the parents. The frustrations with the system. Um, despite that, um, you know, we, I think that what the film uh, does for me is show that the, the little rewards are what often keep us going. Um, we know the, the big challenges. And those big challenges, however, are uh, to go to the, the, the uh, first part. The, we do have shortages, um, but they're not quite the you know, monolithic, they're all the same. Um, if, you, if you look at the big level, in the 50 states, we produce enough people every year out of universities with credentials for all the jobs if you look across the country. The problem is more distribution. Um, in the state of California, we don't produce enough teachers. Uh, the, the almost 90 institutions that have uh, approved programs don't produce enough teachers for all the vacancies. Uh, but, but the vast majority of states in this country do. Uh, they don't, they're not like California. They not, don't have the huge um, 
K-12 population grows. Uh, so, you know, at one level we have enough people, to, our teachers, but they're not where we need them. Um, we also have uh, shortages in certain areas. Uh, there aren't enough people who want to teach math. There are not enough people who want to teach uh, science. There are not enough people who are prepared to do special ed. Uh, so while we have, uh, we in some ways have uh, more people who uh, are prepared to teach English, um, but you know, so there's shortages in terms of subject area. There are also shortages in places. Uh, urban areas have shortages in all states. So that even I came from the state of Kansas where I was at the University of Kansas, in the cities and in the suburbs, uh, outside the cities, there were lots of people who wanted uh, to teach and plenty of um, jobs for them. But in, the, in Kansas City and Wichita, there weren't enough. And that's, that's the case across the country. Um, and the other is that we need more teachers of color. If you look at who are in our classrooms in K-12 schools, um, they are, it's a wide diversity of ethnicity, of um, various uh, socioeconomic, uh, but we, our teachers by and large are not, don't reflect the classroom. And so we have shortages. It's not just a simple matter of numbers, but it's also who we can attract. And that's the traditional uh, going through the universities. We have lots of people in the, the uh, preparation business. Besides universities, there are um, for-profits that prepare teachers. Uh, there are alternative routes in California, the emergency, emergency permit. Um, if a district wants to hire someone and they don't have a, a license or a credential, they can be hired for up to three years and then uh, get, about, get their credential. So yes, we have shortages. It is severe in many ways uh, in places like LA because it's a large city. It's, um, uh, we have, we're in a state that doesn't produce enough uh, teachers and um, there are lots of the barriers that people see about teaching. They, don't, they see the, the barriers that you all have identified and you see in the film. They don't understand the part that why people go into teaching. Um, and uh, your second part, um, you sort of answered it. <laughs> okay. You guys have any questions? Yeah, I'd like to ask the group, um, to what extent do you think the, uh, that um, the face of American education would be changed if all of the money that the current uh, Congress wants to give back to the wealthiest 2% of American families, which is approximately $50 billion a year, was just bookkeeped into a fund and it was just distributed throughout the United States on a school district by school district basis. What happens to the lotto money that we're supposed to be getting? I mean, it, I don't know where any of this money goes that even if, it, if that were to happen, I don't know, it, it, it's trickle down effect, it doesn't ever trickle down. Are you, are you talking about the, the federal government, right? The federal, the federal government is going to be doing away with the state taxes, and the printed <coughs> estimates are $50 billion a year to 2% of the wealthiest families in America each year. And that's not $50 billion that leaves them broke. That's, they're getting probably $200 billion and they're going to give up 50 mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just curious as to how you feel uh, especially you, because you're an educator and you understand budgetary considerations and the macroeconomics of education. How would that affect America? And why aren't teachers en masse going to the federal government and saying, hey, wait a minute, look at this film and give us the money? Because that's what the American public wants. They're just being snowed by the leaders in Congress, most Republicans, some Democrats who voted in favor of that give back to already unbelievably wealthy people in this country? Well, most of the funding um, for uh, school districts come from the states. So the, the $50 billion uh, that's going back to the, the wealthy, I mean, the feds still have lots of money, and, but they're only about 7% of the, across the country of the budgets that come to uh, K-12 public schools. I'd rather have a storm the state legislature because they really uh, control most of the money um, that goes to schools and talk about how we can target um, and come up with incentives to get and keep good teachers in the classroom. 
uh, how we can uh, alleviate the overcrowding, how we can make schools uh, place, there are enough schools, enough classrooms. Um, and, and that to me, would we'd have more impact by going to states and, and showing this film than to the feds. Right. Well, I, that's why I was asking about the federal government, because it seems that most of the budget of the school comes from the state, mm -hmm. from the state. But um, yeah, I mean, on a, on a, on a <coughs> micro level, at, at my school, for example, we're a school with almost 100% Title I enrollment. I mean, we get a lot of extra money from the government. And I don't think it's a question of, I mean, it seems like the money needs to be spent, obviously, in a more, in a more smart fashion than to say there just needs to be more of it. Um, but I think we've, we've seen improvements where the class size has gone to 20 to 1. And like you do talk about also teacher retention, I mean, obviously raising the salary. Or you saw in the film, the uh, speech therapist, I mean, they still have a huge shortage. I mean, it's going to go, go on until there's more incentive to become a speech therapist. Uh, so, are you asking, do I feel any personal bitterness as a teacher because there was a tax break given, or do I just think it's no, dumb? No, I'm not asking you about that. That's another issue. I'm just saying, how do you think it would affect American education? That's it. It, it. Doesn't matter whether you would go to. You can't go to the most states because states are running out of money. I mean, the last nine months have seen some of the greatest shortfalls in state budgets for states that thought they were in fat city in August of 2001. So that's not the, the issue I'm trying to raise. If the money was available. How would it affect education? Pro or con, or would make a difference at all? Fifty billion dollars a year to people who are already well, driving Bentleys. I well, how could you not yeah. say that money money wouldn't be a good well, thing? Well, just asking a question. I mean, I I mean, mean you know, would a it? Rhetorical and, question, almost, because it's like, how couldn't that so money you're saying, be you're beneficial? To me, uh, as an interested party, that money is a major issue in the quality of education. Absolutely. For people in this film. It's not I mean, an issue for graduating with Westlake, a right? no, but gra like I graduated with a master's in education. Um, any other master's degree in any other field starts out paying thirty-five thousand dollars a year more, and I have you know my peers who are all graduates who are making way more money, moving up the salary scale. I I enjoy what I do, so I mean, yes, I get to hold that over them, um, <laughs> but. <laughs> But, you know, there are things that, comforts that would be nice too, and that sometimes when you have those hard days that you don't think about, oh, well, at least when they have hard days, they have money to, like, comfort them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, this is a question for Davis, actually. I was wondering what inspired you to make this film? Was it, like, a teacher? Or did you have any background in education? And um, also, how you found the teachers that you selected to highlight in the film? Um, I was, we were about to have a kid. <laughs> this is about five years ago. My son is four and a half, so at least my wife is pregnant. And I was, and I was thinking about schools and public schools in LA and reading, and started to more and more start to read the articles about LAUSD and the budget for LAUSD and getting frustrated. And the more I would read the editorials and the debate about schools, I mean, it gets very confusing. And when you're a parent, you start to go. And, um, I, and I, I didn't want to make a movie that was another film that trashed the school system. But I knew I thought that I thought that a movie could do, you know, I thought I thought I, I should get involved somehow. So, and then I was at a party, and uh, a friend of mine's wife, uh, my friend of mine is an editor who actually ended up editing part of this film. His wife um, was it was a night before her first day of teaching, and uh, I said, "Are you kidding me? You're, you're starting?" I'm like, yeah. "So can I come and we'll just watch you?" I didn't have any cameras. I was just I want to watch what you're doing, and she didn't know enough to know that she wasn't allowed to. To bring me, I mean, you have to sign up a visitor, but and the school didn't know that I was there, so. And but, she said, meet me at the corner of Third and La Brea at the Seven Eleven at six a.m. in the morning, and I, and I went, and I was like, it was still dark out, and we got our little Seven Eleven styrofoam cups, coffee, and we're driving down in our Honda Civic, down into, East LA, and before I even got into the classroom, I'm like, this is a point of view of teaching I've never seen before. 
this person making a choice to go outside of the comfort of her world into. And then after a week of just sitting behind her class, um, just watching, I realized that there was a, a point of view about education, a point of view about teachers that I'd never seen before. And it was it, at the most essential level just dramatically compelling. And then after, on top of that built a lot of ambition in terms of helping. But in the sec there's another. The second part of the question was just how did you select the teachers? It's um, a good question. Um, we were about three weeks before the first day of school, and uh, we just, uh, Julia, who's the producer, is behind there. She's Julia Schachter, waving. And um, we just tried to find as many teachers as we could. We got permission from the LAUSD, which was a huge, very difficult thing to have. And the Getty, uh, Barry Munitz of the Getty, gave us early, early money and said, this is a great idea. And so we just uh, called the principals we knew through the LAUSD and asked, can you put us in touch with teachers? And we found about 40 teachers who we sort of interviewed on the phone. Mm -hmm. And then we had a, um, a round table interview that first week of school uh, and put a lot of teachers on camera and saw which ones would, were comfortable and ultimately, we started with 10. And uh, we knew, because we knew we dropped some teachers. And ultimately, what happened was the teachers that uh, had a hard time opening up to us and letting us come in were the ones we didn't follow. And we were, we were sympathetic to that. We were always trying to get into their lives as they knew and, and, and pushing, <laughs> yeah. pushing, pushing. Yeah. yeah. All sorts of things. But also, the same, <laughs> all sorts of things. <laughs> Um, one, one morning we actually snuck into a teacher's, he knew we were coming, but we wanted to see him wake up. <laughs> and, and he said, you know, I, I, want, I said, I want to be there when you turn the light on. And so, so we, 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 we did this with a lot of them. And we, uh, we, and he said, this is my apartment. And we, we got up and it was dark and we, and we opened the door. He said, I'll leave the door open for you. And so we went in and we went with our cameras and, 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 uh, I think it was Julia or someone said, it's a wrong house. <laughs> <laughs> and we went out and we went to a different, I just remember this. But then we sat there and we were, and his alarm went off and we're waiting for him to wake up and he didn't wake up. It was, and then finally, 15 minutes later, he turned the light. So that was kind of funny. <laughs> I'm not sure that answered your question. But okay. Oh, I'm in charge. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's like in my house. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I want to ask a question about uh, the film uh, deciding to, to emphasize your uh, addressing intolerance, which seems to me to always bring out very irrational uh, people from the closet. So I'm kind of wondering when I'm behind the scenes. For instance, the scene when you went in to ask permission to show the film, I always got the impression that it helped quite a bit having somebody film that. I mean, it just seemed to collapse <laughs> as if he's having a better thought of it. first seemed to be stalling. And so, I, did he get prepped for this ahead of time, or did it really no. happen the way it, it was kind of an honest happening? It, it, and then all, the second part is, how about all the parents and so forth? Did you get a lot of flack after uh, they found out you were doing this? Um, well, it it actually did happen the way it looked, and um, that day I just have to apologize to Julia because the night before she, I was sick that day, and the night before she called me at ten o'clock. Are you going to ask permission tomorrow at eight a.m.? Said, don't ever call me when I'm sleeping. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I went in that morning, and he, I knew that our principal had a pr principal's meeting all day, and I had to get him just in this little window, and they'd come when I tried to ask him another time. and So I wasn't really as last minute as I seen there. But anyways, he did just say yes. He, <coughs> Bud Jacobs, Bud Jacobs is a fly by the seat of his pants kind of principal. Um, he is now like in charge of all high school services for LAUSD. Um, he's been promoted. And he is, he's sort of a go with your gut kind of principal, and he was very successful that way. Um, he's also not a very by the books, get caught up. Venice High School has a long history of being pretty liberal. Um, anyhow, I did, um, I did get some negative feedback. Uh, regarding the 
tolerance unit. It was a unit called the ISMS unit, and we talk about sexism, racism, anti-Semitism. Heterosexism is one of the isms. I don't teach that all year. You know, um, <laughs> that was about film. three days of filming of a whole year that they shadowed me. Um, that's in, you know that you get in a total of 12 minutes in an hour and a half. So you're looking at a slice of of what was going on. Um, when I had taught that unit, the, the course was a semester course, so I got to, they filmed it the second time I had taught it. Um, because I taught it first semester and they had, we didn't know that that was gonna be something that was like controversial and made for good documentary filmmaking. They, they, they filmed it second semester. First semester, however, I had had um, some families that, uh, one particular family that was very upset with it and thought that I was teaching children to become gay. Um, and I was fortunate that I had great administrative support at Venice High School um, where they, they asked to meet with me and the principals, which of course you're a first year teacher and you're sort of scared, you know, the principals, do they even know my name, you know, <laughs> and hi, I'm, and nobody knows I'm teaching this stuff, like, there's no, no one's ever observed me, they don't know what I'm teaching, um, and then I'm being brought in, um, for teaching this, and the, I, I met with the administration first, and I said, I am teaching a non-violence approach to tolerance. What I am teaching my students is they do not have the right to verbally assault or physically assault anyone um, because of their race, because of their sexual preference, because of their gender, any of those reasons. And that is what I'm teaching to my kids. I'm not saying they have to go out and become best friends with a gay person. I'm not saying they need to um, you know, all of a sudden take up a gay lifestyle. I'm just saying they do not have the right to hurt another be a person. And um, the administration understood that. The parents wanted to like see all my lesson plans and, and go really into detail and have their child removed from my classroom while I taught this. And the administration said, no, we think your child should see this. Um, we endorse what she is teaching. It is part of the cultural awareness life skills curriculum for Los Angeles Unified to teach tolerance. It didn't have anything addressing heterosexism, but it just said to teach a tolerance unit. Um, and it, it fits the standards, and, and we support what she's doing, and um, your child will not have excused absences for missing this, this part of the class. And so I felt really good to have that kind of administrative support. I mean, it's not all bad. Well, that's encouraging. Thank yeah. you. Hi. Um, first of all, the film was really great. I saw it on PBS, and I saw it just now. Um, question going back to the barriers to being a teacher. Obviously, you know, through the film and through what we all hear anecdotally, there are lots of barriers. Teachers don't get paid enough. Problems in the classroom, blah, blah, blah. We, you know, the whole story. What about the barriers to actually becoming a teacher, such as the credentialing process, such as applying, something as simple as applying to LA Unified School District, um, <laughs> which, which I've heard from a couple of smart, very well-educated, very capable friends of mine who decided to go and try teaching, it was hell to get through <laughs> just the hoops. So that, that's definitely one part of the question. The other part, though, that I think is a larger question, I think, that, that I think Teach for America probably addresses this to some degree. What about the barriers, the credentialing process itself? What about all, I taught in a school for one year when I lived in Washington, D.C., when I was going to graduate school. I didn't have an education degree. I had never taught before, except maybe swimming in high school and stuff. And I was hired as a teacher at a Catholic school. And I think I did a great job. It was one of the better years. I mean, it was a fabulous, fun, great, memorable year for me. Why can't more smart, well-educated people become teachers without going through what many people think is the very arduous process of this credentialing and this certification and these education courses, which a lot of people just don't really <laughs> find a lot of consonants with? That's a question for everybody, probably though, for, for Ken Gallagher, is, is... 
Well, I mean, the, the first part of your question was um, uh, about just getting the credential. Yeah. And well, yeah, that was the second part. Yeah. But that, well, yeah, that. what was the first part? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. Mm -hmm. The. Um, <laughs> Quite frankly, I, I've been in um, seven different states uh, dealing with education, and there are lots of people who want to be teachers. And um, in states where they only have one way to do it, that is to go through uh, a university, that, that's what they do. Um, we have a lot of people at USC who want to be teachers. Um, depending on when they decide that, uh, they, can, you know, they come to the School of Ed and they can go through a traditional route. If they don't decide that till they're a senior, that it's hard to say, yeah, you can get this done and be out of here. Credentialing is a is an arduous process. Uh, it is there are 50 different systems. California's is like most states is going through a whole change in upping standards uh, about what we expect teachers to know and be able to do their first year. Um, it is um, um, a barrier to a lot of people uh, to do that. Um, those who do get through and get their credential, half of them don't go in, in some states, half of them don't go into teaching. They don't even look uh, for, you know, for lots of different reasons. Though, I, and what I do remember, what you, you pointed out how difficult it is in some places to get a job. Uh, you want to teach. Yes. Mine specifically with LAUSD. Yeah. And it is difficult. Yeah. such capable people who have huge careers doing other things. Mm -hmm. They can. And I, I don't know what uh, Nate and Joy found, but it, it is very oh, I difficult. I would love to share it. It's yeah. a nightmare. Well, it's, uh, it is very difficult. I would difficult. love to share it. Yeah. You it, go and you spend an hour waiting to give your paper to somebody so that they can stamp it, and then they tell you to walk it to the next room, where you wait another hour for It takes someone. two days. Yeah. It takes two full eight-hour days during the week, Monday to Friday, 8 to 5. Um, it takes two full days. <laughs> yeah. Because in a, in a normal business world, wouldn't the first person just forward it on to the next department and the next department and you would just be done? Like that would be efficient. Yeah. But no, I don't know. <laughs> they, they have, they have uh, I mean, you, I'm sure both of us and anybody who's signed up to teach it in Los Angeles could tell you stories. But just for example, I was a substitute in Santa Barbara and I had to get a provisional credential there and turn in a tuberculosis test and my fingerprints. And there's, there's a whole list of things you have to do. So they you know, sent those all and put them in a file in Sacramento, I assume. And about two months later, I start, signed up to be a teacher here in LA and I had to go through the entire process again so they could put another folder with my name on it with a TB test and a fingerprint and you know, the whole list of things again right next to the other Nathaniel Monley folder, I assume. I don't know. <laughs> but there, but there's, there's just a lot of, there's, there are a lot of uh, paperwork type things that make it annoying at least to be a teacher. I mean, just in the beginning, I mean, you get that done and you kind of, you kind of learn the ins and outs of yeah, all the red tape now that we're third-year veterans. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you kind of figure out some of the shortcuts of the system, which, like our students do too. Mm. But that's what stops a lot of people. They even uh, teachers who come from other states who have a credential from another state find the same difficulty in getting through uh, uh, LA in particular. But I mean, large city systems, there is a bureaucracy of getting hired, and there are all these. Um, uh, legal or regulatory steps that have to be done. And oftentimes, one of the bigger, bigger problems in, um, in larger systems is they don't decide to start looking for teachers until August, which for a lot of people, they've already, they need a job before August, and they've, they've found a job somewhere else because not every school district has this kind of uh, bureaucracy for getting hired. And so that, you know, that turns off a lot of people that they just can't wait or they are just, they don't have 16 hours, two days in a row to, to walk through. Uh, so, the, you know, part of the uh, problem, shortages is just getting through the system. And um, on the other hand, there are, di there are districts that have figured this out and they, they don't, they have a very easy system. You, in fact, don't even have to do it in person. You submit your materials and you know other people do the uh, the process and they call you and you go and interview and you can get hired so that's some of you know some of that is a system that is so large uh, New York had the same pro uh, has the same problem Chicago in terms of the, the the steps that must be taken before we can hire someone um, 
I want, can I go back to your, your question too about you know do people the the going through education courses and right, going, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. well I mean I, how many people in here are teachers okay um, and how many went through the traditional going through the university okay um, in the state of California the um, in order to be an elementary teacher uh, you you don't you can't major in education. You, um, that's a, a state law, uh, you, um, and yet there is a, a bound curriculum that you need to have learned in order to uh, cover all the subject areas that students in elementary school will have. So we, you know, it's general studies here at, at USC, it's liberal studies at, uh, in other uh, universities. But it basically is a, a balancing act between trying to, um, uh, have students take the courses in the content area that the state says they need in order to be a licensed uh, uh, elementary teacher. And um, of all that we require here at USC to get a degree, a baccalaureate degree, um, it's about, uh, I think we're 136 hours, 132 hours there. Uh, 30 of those hours, 32 of those hours are with education. All the rest are in the College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. Uh, and included in that is the hours of going out and student teaching. So, uh, you know, uh, the courses that, that are required in terms of pedagogy or instruction are to help people deal with the diversity you found in your classrooms. The, the students who aren't eager, uh, to those that are very eager, the, the bright students, the students who need help, the, with uh, um, the students who have exceptional needs, how to deal with all of that, how to understand the curriculum, how to teach to standards, how to use test results, those are, that's all pedagogy. That's all the kinds of things you have to know as well as needing to know your subject area. Um, I think that, um, you know, you, you came through a traditional program. Yes, yes, but I might get lots of Rappers thrown at me if I say where. Oh, well, we do on that. <laughs> yeah, let's see now. Um, I, I, did, I did my master's in teaching credential um, separate. I was an art history major for undergrad. Um, but I, I actually got a lot out of my education classes, and I don't know if, I don't know if that's a universal experience. I, I didn't think I liked them very much at the time, but more and more I find myself um, I had a lot of theory mm -hmm. in my classes mm -hmm. and I thought, just give me like the 10 how-to lesson plans that'll work in any situation, <laughs> that's all I want. And, and now I'm realizing that the, you know, the importance of all of those theory classes. The thing that I found such a huge obstacle um, was student teaching because financially um, it was very difficult on me. I mean, I student taught for a semester before the film ever got started, so at least I had a little bit of experience in front of students. But being able to pay my bills, mm -hmm. and it was an unpaid internship, and yet I was doing all of this work for this teacher who was getting paid, you know, for standing in the back of the room and occasionally telling me, you should repeat yourself three times whenever you give instructions to a kid. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that that was really hard that the, that you have to do an unpaid internship is what student teaching is, and you have to grade all these papers, and it's like, it's not like I'm doing an internship at this law firm where I'm gonna get done and I'm gonna make $120,000 a year. Mm -hmm. I'm doing an internship and I'm gonna start at 35, at the time when I started it was $32,000 a year, and to work six months for free and not be able to, I mean, teaching is consuming. You're in the middle of the night, you finally figure out how you're gonna do your lesson plan, you wake up and you write it down. I mean, there's no way you could have another job and student teach, and you're still taking classes, and... And we won't let you. <laughs> we say, no, you've got to be in the classroom. You've got to focus it, it was on just, that. It was, it was too much, and I mm -hmm. think it's ridiculous for the state to expect that. I think student teachers should get paid. Mm -hmm. I have a question just for, just for um, everybody who raised their hands. How many of you are teaching in public schools, and how many are teaching in... How many public schools? And how many in private? Hmm. I, just listening to you, I was wondering, gosh, it must, no wonder so many more people want to teach in a private school because you don't have to do anything, right? There's no credentialing at all to teach. Yeah, but there's also not as much money as a public school. There's not as much money. No. no really? No, no, not most oh, I would so, think yeah. there would be more. No. Hmm. Um, Davis, I was really, I know you must have had 
so much footage to have to make decisions on. But I thought it was amazing. My sister used to teach in Harlem, and used to is the key word, unfortunately, because I was really glad that you included Nate's and his family of teachers. <laughs> because one of the things that I don't think is really s sort of made, the students I don't think really understand about tr letting some of the bureaucracy roll because it is so overwhelming. And you know, you, you come in with good intentions and sort of, unless you have that insight. So I was glad that you chose to include that because I imagine you just had so many decisions to make in terms of that. But I think that's one of those things that sort of does get short shrift and it's a huge part of the, part of the job. Mm -hmm. So I was really pleased to see that. Good choice. I think uh, I didn't, something I didn't say in answer uh, to your first question, one thing I really gained from having the, the family was just uh, a perspective on educational theory and thought and how it's such a gigantic shifting creature, you know? It goes from here to here to here to here, back and forth, and even in three years I've seen it shift, but listening to my parents talk and uh, my uncles and my aunts talk about um, the way that's, uh, like my uncle John's talking about Oh, I forget the name of the educational movement at the time, but Summerhill, Summerhill schools, uh, and the way that they thought about education, and it's it's like, at least it it was it, it that lent me some perspective, uh, and allowed me not to uh, stress out too much when I would hear that how they had to do this, you know, and had to do that because I got a lot of help from that because it's true. Um, this first question is for Nate and Joy, and then the second for whoever. Um, what are you doing now, and where are you teaching, and what are your intentions for the future? Do you intend to stay in education and teaching, or um, in the field of education? And what do you think would allow there to be um, first-year teachers and second-year and third-year teachers to stay in the profession and continue teaching? Because um, I've noticed there's usually teachers teach for a couple years, and then they drop out or something happens. Um, what would fix that? Right, the numbers are incredible. Um, mm -hmm. No, what what exactly? Thirty percent after uh, the first three years. Thirty percent. And I think it's up to fifty percent by the fifth year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we can Drop keep out. people in the classroom five years, they tend to stay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so your question is two parts. What are we doing now, and then what, from our perspective, could be done to keep me or you in the classroom? You go first. Okay. <laughs> I. Uh, I am, I'm still teaching fifth grade at the same school in the same classroom, uh, room 27. And uh, uh, I, have, I have Juan's little brother, Charlie, is in my class now. And he's, 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 he's really cool. I, I love teaching. I love this class. Uh, it's my best one yet. I mean, I really have a good time with them. And we've had some great experiences this year. We went to, I was telling Davis and Lisa and Joy, that we went to uh, uh, winter camp in February and uh, for a whole week. Got to go up in the snow. And we're going up to Sacramento in June, and we're, uh, we're really excited about that. Um, so I really love that. I, I am going to leave uh, LA this year. I'm getting married, and I want to move to, uh, well, anyway. I, but I, I, I do want to stay in education. I'm not giving you my whole, you know, my whole future plan, you know, my five-year plan, my 10-year plan. But yes, I do want to stay in education. I would like to, uh, personally, I have a vision for a, uh, a charter school uh, with migrant workers in the Central Valley. That's the area where I grew up. And I would love to, I'm planning on going to Europe to study language acquisition. And uh, I want to take some of the European methodology of teaching language acquisition and bring it back here and try to nurture and foster uh, a culture, at least in a small community, uh, where languages are appreciated and where uh, that can really happen. And, uh, per, promote appreciation for Spanish and English, particularly in the Central Valley. But yeah, I, I want to stay in education for sure. Um, I'm still at Venice High School, and I do have a classroom now. Um, I'm not teaching the ninth grade cultural awareness life skills anymore. Um, and I'm teaching, um, I ha was teaching US history that year um, of the film. Um, I continue teaching US history, and I teach advanced placement art history which goes to my undergraduate degree, which was sort of my passion. I worked in museum education before I went into teaching and um, always wanted to be teaching about 
artists and looking at history through the lives of artists. Um, so it's all 11th and 12th grade now, which sort of spoils me for any of you who teach high school, because teaching ninth grade was like trying to keep 40 corks underwater all at the same time. <laughs> and they're just like <laughs> popping up. Um, and you don't have like 20 to 1 ratios. It's 40 in a class. and it's So um, it's sort of nice now to have older kids where their hormones are just a little tamer, um, I guess. Uh, I plan on staying in education. Um, this year I took on a new position as a curriculum coordinator, so I'm integrating technology into the curriculum um, and just trying to get more diverse experiences. And uh, It's really nice now to have taught U.S. history three and a half years, to be in my second year of teaching AP art history and really developing those lesson plans and that curriculum and have a couple things under my belt, know how to handle discipline. It just I would say the amount of time I'm spending on it is now um, I'm able to do the things that I really want to do. I'm not just constantly frantically going, oh, I've got to do photocopies and I've got to, you know, I'm able to actually sit down and give positive feedback and do all those things that I wanted to do, but I was so consumed. I'm able to call parents and respond to issues that really are crying out for my attention, but that I felt like in my first couple of years I just didn't have the time to do. And it's, I want to give it more time so that I can get better at that. Uh, as far as the second part of the question, um, well, some of the some teachers in here, you all know, uh, we, we get a lot of bonuses as teachers that other people don't. Summertime, big breaks, you know, and my, my, my friends look at that and they're like, dang, you got it easy. But then I'm like, well, how am I supposed to support a family, you know, a couple years down the road? The salary scale does not climb high enough, first of all. Second of all, it's an underappreciated position for the work that we do. All of you know that. I mean, how many took your teachers for granted? But then look at the society at large, and uh, as far as the professional standing, you know, what's the prestige level of a teacher? Not that it's all about prestige, but that definitely enters into your mind. And um, the, I think that uh, teacher, they're, 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 teach, the teaching salary scale needs to go much higher. I mean, I don't mind being a young starter and getting paid when I'm getting paid, but. When you're a professional that's been doing it for several years, like in any field, you should get more money. I mean, that's just the long and the short of it. I think you even should get it at the beginning because what's to motivate like a 4.0 brilliant college graduate yeah. to go into teaching? You don't want to, I mean, you got to just get, get bright students from the get-go to enter the field. Um, I think in terms of keeping people in education, um, I actually calculated for a survey that um, my college sent to me uh, how many hours a week do you work on average now? And I calculated I work 58 hours a week. Um, and then I said, okay, 58 hours a week times 52 weeks a year. And I came out with that total and I said, okay, well, what if I did work, or no, no, times, I work 58 hours a week times uh, 40 weeks in a year. And I calculated that number out. I said, well, what if I work 40 hours a week times 52 weeks a year? And I actually still am working more hours as a teacher with summers off than someone who was working a 40 hour a week job, which was like astonishing to me when I just decided to do that little mathematical equation. Um, I think what keeps me in teaching is I do feel like I get a lot of respect from my friends and family for what I do. Um, I think it's so important to have people in your own circle that respect you for what you do. I think if I have a friend who did go to school with me and she dropped out of teaching. Um, because her family did not respect teaching. They said, why didn't you become a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or one of those kinds of professions? And she, she left to go to law school. Um, so I think that you need to feel that what you're doing is worthwhile and have people that respect you for it. Even if sometimes people say to you, oh, but you get your summers off. That's not a real job. Um, I mean, it's like, I raise your kids, OK? <laughs> you don't want to pay me anything. I mean. Really, your kids spend more time with me every week than they do with you. I, you know, they're with me 40 hours a week. Um, so I think it's important to value teachers. Um, I also think it's important to continue your education and stay um, passionate and inspired and have um, professional development circle groups that you meet with and you share ideas. It shouldn't just be that you're doing this as part of your education or you come to this little group because you have a class that you know it's requiring you to come. It should be because you want to come, you want to hear new ideas, you want to get re-inspired. 
you're net, I network with a lot of teachers. I don't stay in my own little bubble in my room. Um, I go out, I go for beers with my friends, you know, and I feel a part of that community of teachers that makes me feel bonded to Venice High School and doesn't make me want to just pick up and go to a suburban school. So I think that all of that, you know, that community and that respect keeps me in teaching. Okay, two, oh, sorry, Can I just add oh, yeah. one thing? One of the things that we do know keeps teachers in classrooms, beginning teachers, is a support from their colleague teachers. And uh, California has several uh, support system, BITS is the one I know the, the best, the beginning teacher support assistance. And it is to help teachers. To, uh, Nate had his parents and his, his family who could kind of, he could go to and get some perspective. But it's, we all need that as a, as a beginning uh, teacher, uh, whatever the, the classroom. And so having that support where you know you can go and talk to someone, a colleague, and either complain or say, where can I get this or how do I do all of these things, um, is really a critical piece for a lot of people staying in the, staying in the classroom, and not just saying, this is not worth it, I'm leaving. And all other professions have, you know, doctors, uh, they, as they, they aren't just expected to come right out of their preparation and jump in, and people just leave them alone. Um, so it, that kind of support for new teachers, we do know when we look uh, in, in states and in systems that have uh, implemented these mentoring, keeps people there. Uh, it doesn't eliminate many of the things that you still have to learn, but it is someone you can go to and get some help. That's okay, one more question. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Jeez, this is terrible. Okay, way in the back. <laughs> okay, my question is kind of switching it up. Um, I have more of a question about the moments of the film, and so this would go more so to Davis. Um, how did, what was the size of your crew that you brought into these classrooms in order to get these real moments from not only the teachers, but from the students, and <coughs> for you to be able to put together such a great film like you did? Thank you. Um, uh, we started with a traditional crew with uh, beta cam, cameraman or woman, uh, sound man or woman, um, an assistant, uh, Julia and myself, so that's six people. And um, over time it started to shrink because we realized that uh, we didn't want to make as big, uh, we didn't want to take over the classroom the way we, and, and, and some of the things that we were really being compelled by were these very intimate scenes that you're talking about. And sometimes, so it started to shrink, and the camera started to get smaller. It started to use this DV cam. And when I look at the footage now, I'm still a little bit horrified about how sort of um, junky it looks sometimes. But it, it doesn't seem to matter. What mattered, and I think what, what, what the revelation was is that you know, you're, shoot, you're filming kids, and if a kid starts to say something in class, a big boom comes across. And this, and this big microphone goes in their face. And there, there's some of that, they will tell you that. But um, over time, sometimes it would be um, just me on the floor with a little camera, and the sound guy was outside, or another person, another cameraman. And, um, and so uh, that's, we, and we realized as the stories were going that some of the more important stories were, were really small ones, and that we didn't want to impose too much. We shot a lot of footage, and a lot of the work was in editing, just to pull it together. Well, we have a reception outside um, where we can continue talking. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our panelists. <laughs> and thank you very, very much for coming. Yes, join us upstairs. And also, I just want to introduce one other person that's here. We have the regional director for Teach for America, who has an information booth up here. Monica Vasquez, is she? There she is. And so if, she has a, if you have any questions about Teach for America, she'll be upstairs to take questions. But please join us upstairs and uh, we'll continue the discussion.